Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. We are exceptionally fortunate to have our ALC faculty keynote speaker here today. Rosalind W. Picard is the founder and director of the Affective Computing Research Group at the MIT Media Lab, co-founder of Affectiva, which delivers technology to help measure and communicate emotion, and co-founder and chief scientist of Empatica, improving lives with clinical quality wearable center sensors and analytics. Professor Picard is the author of over 200 peer-reviewed scientific articles in multidimensional signal modeling, computer vision, pattern recognition, machine learning, and human-computer interaction. She is known internationally for her book, Affective Computing, which helped launch a new field by that name. She was a founding member of the IEEE Technical Committee on Wearable Information Systems in the days when they decided that the name Wearable Computing, or WC for short, might not provide the best acronym. <laughs> she, <laughs> she is a graduate with highest honors from the Georgia Institute of Technology and holds master and doctoral degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. She is an active inventor, and her group's inventions have been twice named to top 10 lists, including the New York Times Magazine Best Ideas of 2006 for the social cue reader used in autism, and 2011's Popular Science Top 10 Inventions for a mirror that monitors vital signs. Professor Picard lives in Newton with her husband, Len, also an MIT alum, EECS and Sloan. Is he around here? Can, okay. <laughs> and their three teenage sons. Years ago, Professor Picard and her students at MIT began to design, build, and test both wearable and other sensors for recognizing emotion. They designed studies, gathered, gathered data, and developed signal processing and machine learning techniques to see what could be reliably extracted. In this talk, Professor Picard will highlight several of the most surprising findings during this adventure. These include new insights about the true smile of happiness, discovering that regular cameras and your smartphone, even in your handbag, can sense your biosignals, finding electrical signals on the wrist that give insight into deep brain activity and learning surprising implications of wearable sensing for autism, anxiety, depression, sleep memory, consolidation, epilepsy, and more. <laughs> Professor Rosalind, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here with my fellow MIT alums. Uh, I'm gonna start with an example of us uh, doing an experiment to elicit what we uh, believe to be the most common emotion when people use technology. Anybody want to guess what that is? Frustration, Frustration. yes. <laughs> Gee. Uh, all right, let's uh, show you what this is like. Oh, by the way, when, you, when your goal is to elicit frustration, you don't want to tell people uh, that that's your goal. You want to give them something else to do. So here they are uh, <laughs> filling out. <laughs> <laughs> they, they believe they're filling out an online form and they're going to give us some feedback about the experience. getting through this form. Would you mind looking at the camera and share your thoughts on how to improve the form?
When, when we, by the way, all of our human subjects experiments go through the MIT Committee on Humans as Experimental Subjects first, <laughs> uh, we assure them that we're doing nothing worse than that people experience in everyday life. <laughs> so you can see this as a situation that is unpleasant, and indeed uh, everybody expressed quite a bit of frustration. This was just a, a sample of it. Now, in the course of this, we... Uh, we started with this belief, and I wrote about this in my book, Affective Computing, that the way to tell if people are truly happy is to tell if they're just smiling with their mouth, which is fake, right, like cheese in front of the camera, versus if they're smiling with their mouth and with their eyes. These, uh, of course, all have numbers, like MIT buildings, uh, action unit 12 for the lip corner pull and action unit 6 for the cheek raise. So if you see a 6 and a 12, then that's supposed to mean you're truly happy, right? Uh, well, that's what the, um, you know, the great uh, psychologist Paul Ekman and others have said. Uh, that's what the TV show Lie to Me is based on his work. Um, but when, in MIT fashion, we get real data and start to look at what people really do in natural life, we find some surprises. For example, this is... Oh. <laughs> 6 and 12. 6 and 12. 6 and 12, hmm. Um, and I'm not talking about the buildings there, but the facial action units. We find that 90% of people actually showed this, quote unquote, true smile of happiness during frustration. Uh, <laughs> so in MIT faction style, we go in and we dissect this a little bit. It's not enough to just take these peak moments that supposedly mean happiness. And when people look at this, they think, ah, he's really happy. Uh, but we, I won't go through the math here, um, but I know you're all capable of it, do the machine learning to build the models and understand not just those peak moments, but the dynamic trajectories that lead up to them. And it's more complicated than the speed, but the speed is a big part of it. Typically, when people smile with true happiness, it builds more slowly. When they smile with frustration, then it's kind of a quick knee-jerk type of a response. And while the humans and machines are about the same at recognizing the truly delighted smiles, uh, the ones that look like delight but are actually frustration, people are a little bit worse than machines at right now uh, at doing that. So that was a bit of a surprise too. Now, machines, um, that doesn't mean machines are better than us at recognizing facial expressions. We've still got about 10,000 different things happening on the face, and computers are getting good at uh, a couple dozen of them right now. Let me give you an example of where we first went online to try to crowdsource this problem, because our machine learning was based on a small number of people, and we needed a lot more. All right, so we, we saw those top two graphs are actually smile, people who are smiling a little bit before the punchline, and the bottom um, are people who are seeing it for the first time, and they smile once they realize you know, that it's the clicker. Uh, this ability to get people to log in online and turn on their cameras and have the computer watch them watching something uh, was something we weren't sure people would do, but turns out they will. And we also see not only uh, smiling, but a huge, arrange, a huge array of natural facial expressions when people opt in, turn on their cameras, and watch things. Um, in particular, we learned uh, later, you know, all the theory was based on tracking faces with um, the mouth going up equally on both sides. As soon as we started doing political debates, uh, and some other things I won't talk about, we started to realize the theory needed a smirk detector, an asymmetric, <laughs> skeptical mm, facial expression. So we built that also. 
Uh, we learned to, we started working with people on the autism spectrum and with hundreds of examples in the lab, and we could get accurate enough to publish papers, but we couldn't really get it accurate enough without millions of dollars of money, um, which we didn't have, to um, work on uh, in real life. And so we tried to find another route, and that meant starting a company. So this uh, grew into a one, first spin out I was involved in, Affectiva. Uh, and here's Dan McDuff's PhD, where he did some work both at MIT and at Affectiva at separate times to um, help scale this so that we could get not hundreds of examples or thousands, but tens of thousands. And now, actually, Affectiva has uh, it has over a million facial videos and billions of motion points. And that has allowed the accuracy to go up so high that we now have uh, more than 24 facial expressions that are more than 90% accurate. And the now Affectiva has, has just announced they're making this not only free in a demo version that you all can download for free on your uh, smartphones right now from, uh, for either Android or iOS, but also um, for small businesses under a million dollars, they'll let them uh, continue to use it free to build out gaming, education, uh, medical, a whole bunch of different applications that can uh, be improved by the ability to understand if your customer is showing smiles, skepticism, frowns, um, confusion, interest, uh, all kinds of things that we professors in particular want to sometimes read of audiences. Although I remember asking some of my MIT colleagues, you know, do you like to read the facial expressions of your students? And they're like, facial expressions of my students? You know? <laughs> so we, we still could use a little help on that sometimes. <laughs> Now, I mentioned autism. Um, actually, everything I'm talking about today grew out of some projects we've been doing uh, to help people on the autism spectrum. The first was reading faces. Uh, and one day, one of the women who I was working with, who was non-speaking, she typed to talk, a uh, very smart woman. Um, when we were online, I used to, used to say, and, and we'd Skype, uh, she would type, and I would use the audio channel. And when we had bad bandwidth and lost the connection, uh, then one of us became seriously handicapped. Uh, and it was not her, um, even though when you would look at her in real life, um, you might wonder if, if she could communicate at all. When, um, when we were communicating one day, she expressed to me, Roz, you have it wrong. Our biggest problem is not reading other people's faces or reading the minds of others or understanding other people's emotions. Um, our biggest problem is you're not understanding us. And at first, I took that kind of personally, like, OK, I know I have room to improve recognizing emotions. She goes, yeah, but it's not just you. It's everybody's misunderstanding us. And what do you mean we're misunderstanding you? Uh, she said, well, we're experiencing enormous stress and anxiety, and you're missing it. Um, what do you mean? And I started to realize, as we took our emotion measurement technology out into the wild and, and measured things, we could measure the stress and anxiety. And we could see that a person might look very calm and chill on the outside, in fact, detached from the world. But inwardly, they're so hyperactivated that they're shutting down to cut out stimuli um, in a protective, intelligent way. Uh, also, a kid might be laying on the floor looking like a lazy bum. Teacher's like, you know, get back in your desk. And the kid is about to explode um, and might erupt in an injurious to himself or others episode. Uh, but if he, he applies deep pressure to his body on the floor, maybe he can calm down enough that he can reintegrate with the classroom. So we realized we were often judging people by what we saw on the outside. Like, here this kid looks stressed, probably is. But I could show you cases where the kid looks super hyperactivated, and he's so under-aroused, he needs 20 minutes on the trampoline before he can focus. So sometimes what we see on the outside and what's going on on the inside were so different uh, that we needed to figure out if we could fix that and observe more something that previously had been unobserved. So we took. Uh, sensors that were known for over 100 years to measure conductance on the palm of the hand. Simple notion, you get stressed, you get your palms sweat, um, the conductance goes up. Um, but it turns out to be a lot more interesting than that. Uh, and, but we started with this notion that it was sort of simple sweat, simple arousal on the palms. 
we at MIT decided, you know, we kind of need to wash our hands. So if you're going to wear it all day, you got to uh, go to alternate locations. So we built versions that could do that. We also built versions that could log the data 24-7. And I happen to be wearing two of them right now that have grown out of this that were commercialized by Empatica. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a co-founder and a shareholder and a volunteer consultant. Uh, but they are, um, this is the Embrace, which I'll say a little bit more about, and the E4. Now, what does this do? Why do we build this? Well, first we built this for research because we realized that we needed to help um, people, we needed to figure out what was going on inside them autonomically. Uh, this is, um, we didn't just want physical activity, which was what was in all the fitness bands at the time, um, and we need temperature to control for heat and sweating. Um, we also wanted to get heart rate and heart rate variability, which we can get from the blood volume pulse from a photopothesmograph, uh, the dual LED sensor, and the skin conductance, which I'm going to say some more about and why it's so interesting. From the um, two main signals that stream off of this device right now to my, my mobile, um, we get the electrodermal activity, which corresponds to the sympathetic nervous system. Fight or flight response goes up uh, with fear and anxiety. And the blood volume pulse, which when you hold still, you get a nice periodic signal from which we can extract the heart rate. When it's very clean, the heart rate variability, dichrotic notch, gets some um, systolic, diastolic information, other interesting stuff from that. These um, two signals help us pull out infor key information about the two main branches of the autonomic nervous system, uh, the fight or flight, um, the skin is purely innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, and the um, rest or digest. The vagal tone uh, we extract from the high-frequency component of the heart rate variability after we extract the beat and interbeat intervals from the heart rate, and that gives us this um, sort of stepping on the brake. So your heart is kind of pre-revved. Right now, you've got the brake on. You've got your vagal uh, um, vagus brake slowing your heart rate. Uh, Big scary thing comes in here. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, break withdraws, uh, and although some of you could probably just remember big scary things that happened in 10-250, um, and the Vegas break <laughs> would withdraw, uh, and your heart rate shoots up, um, or something exciting and new happens, uh, and um, the skin conductance goes up. Here's actual skin conductance data from an MIT student, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is the first data I ever saw where we were finally able to log the skin conductance outside the lab and see what it looked like in real life uh, here around campus. And so we see seven days. This is 24 hours. We see it going up hugely with lab activity, uh, huge activation with MIT studying, and as you would expect, with MIT homeworks and problem sets and MIT labs. Uh, to the embarrassment of we MIT professors, this yellow um, is uh, the low point <laughs> every day classroom activity. Um. <laughs> when um, now, also surprising is this blue labeled data here um, called sleep. Uh, most MIT students are asleep between about. Uh, you know, 2.30 a.m. and um, 5.30 a.m. Uh, and this one's a reasonably regular sleeper because I can draw a vertical rectangle that includes all of their sleep here. And surprisingly, look at this, the biggest peak of the day is often during sleep. Uh, in fact, it's usually during sleep when, when there is a peak during sleep. And if you zoom in on these sort of black fuzzy things, they're high frequency skin conductance responses. At first we thought, oh my gosh, you know, when I first saw them on myself, you know, was I having nightmares and didn't realize it? Or was I sweating during sleep? You know, what is this? Uh, it turns out that they're happening during non-REM sleep. Uh, they're definitely cyclic with the sleep stages. And they do not seem to ha have any correspondence with dreaming that we know of. Um, experts on dreaming like Bob Stickgold tell us that you can actually dream during REM and non-REM sleep. Uh, but these appear, we think right now, to be more related to memory consolidation in our studies and may relate to hippocampal function. So we're doing more research on this, and it's turning out to be quite interesting. Uh, your physiology during sleep is quite different than your physiology during wake. So this uh, uh, may have more to do with learning and memory consolidation and other interesting functions of the brain, um, and it is still disappointing not to see it during classroom activity. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, so one day uh, it was it was like week before finals and uh, in December, and one of my undergrad researchers, one of my year ops, comes to me and says, Professor Picard, could I please borrow one of these sensors? My little brother has autism. He's non-speaking, and I want to see what's stressing him out. Can I take it home over, over winter break? And I said, um, sure. In fact, don't just take one, take two. Because back then, when uh, we hand-built them, they broke all the time. And I said, do you need a soldering iron? Uh, he said, no, I have a soldering iron. Yes, good. <laughs> MIT student has soldering iron. So he, he goes home, uh, I log in, I see the data online for his little brother, I see uh, he's wearing it on both wrists at the same time, the two signals look pretty normal, kid's pretty chill, uh, next day, same thing, pretty low, pretty chill, next day, pretty low, pretty chill, I'm, you know, kind of yawning, I go to the next day, and my jaw drops. One of his wrist signals went so high that I thought the sensor must be broken. Uh, we have stressed people out every way imaginable here at MIT, and I've never seen it go that high. Uh, we've done Boston driver stress experiments. We have the best <laughs> paper of the decade for Boston driver stress, you know, and, and we measured really intense stuff, and nothing was as high as, as this. Um, and the other weird thing is it was only happening on one side. Huh? Like, how do you get stress on one side of your body and not the other? Um, so maybe the other one was broken too. So I start digging through the data, trying to figure out what's going on. I'm an electrical engineer, I should be able to figure this out. Uh, and I'll skip all the debugging here, but a long story short, I uh, wound up doing something I've never done before. I called the student at home on vacation. <laughs> Hi, how's your Christmas? How's your little brother? How's it going? Um, sorry to bug you on vacation. Uh, hey, I can't figure out what happened on this date and this time. And do you have any idea? And he says, I don't know, I'll check the diary. Diary? MIT student keeps a diary <laughs> like, on vacation? Um, now, as a, as a mom of three teenage boys now, I'm, I'm even more marveling at the fact that, that like a teenage boy would write down the exact moment I need, right? Um, so I'm, I'm like, you know, okay, what are the odds he's, he's uh, got this? He comes back, he has the exact date and time, and uh, he says that was right before he had a grand mal seizure. Now, I don't know about you, at the time I knew nothing about seizures except some false stuff I was told as a kid. Quickly started doing research. Uh, next thing I know, I'm on the phone with Dr. Joe Madsen, father of another Europe, who's, he happens to be chief of neurosurgery at Children's. It is so awesome being here at MIT, <laughs> where <laughs> we, are, we have the best connections, and people return your calls. They're so wonderful. Um, hi, Dr. Madsen. My name's Rosalind Picard. Is it possible that somebody could have a huge sympathetic nervous system surge? I didn't want to tell him on just one side. I figured he'd hang up on me. Um, but I said, 20 minutes before a seizure, because that's what it looked like in our data at that time. Um, and he says, probably not. Uh, but you know, we sometimes have patients who have the hair stand on in on one arm uh, before a seizure. On one arm? <laughs> yes, on one arm. And he starts to, and so I fessed up, I showed him the data, we talked at length, and long story short, we made a whole bunch more devices, got them safety certified, enrolled 90 families in a study. Um, they all were children who had continuous seizures that were not being um, successfully treated by medication, so they were all candidates for brain surgery. Uh, Joe was monitoring them around the clock. Um, video EEG, gold standard for epilepsy, ECG, and now EDA, electrodermal activity. We found that 100% of the children in his study had a huge, more than two standard deviations above the pre-seizure period, sympathetic nervous system surge um, with their seizure. Not 20 minutes before, like we, we wished, um, but when you have the gold standard exactly when the brain is starting to fire, it was coinciding with that. So we're not able to get prediction with this right now in most people, although it looks like we might in some, um, but we're able to get detection. Furthermore, uh, we could build, a, and actually Empatica now has improved on this significantly, but at the time my MIT PhD student, Ming Po, published a 94% accurate uh, convulsive seizure detection by combining the skin conductance data with that accelerometer data at the bottom. So you'll see at the bottom uh, these accelerometer peaks. Uh, so the 
state of the art at the time for seizure detection outside the epilepsy monitoring unit is just measuring convulsive movements. Well, that could look like brushing your teeth or strumming the guitar or, or banging on a computer if you're frustrated. Uh, so we um, have now coupled the, uh, these two signals, and there's even more we can do to get a more sensitive and specific seizure detector. By the way, remember how the MIT students sleep was the biggest peak of the day? This is this boy's sleep. So these are huge uh, compared to this. Most of the emotion stuff I'm used to uh, doing signal processing on is down here in the ground cover compared to these like redwood trees poking out here. So this was a huge signal. So we knew we had to do something about this. Uh, we also found this response occurring with 86% of partial seizures. These are seizure, complex partial seizures. These are seizures that can make you unconscious, but they don't have any convulsive movements associated with them. By the way, there's also a lot of other kinds of seizures. Somebody could be having one right now with no convulsions, no loss of consciousness, but just unusual sensory um, experiences, like, like imagining that you're hearing phones going off or something. Um, <laughs> now, when uh, fortunately, most um, epilepsy uh, is not deadly. You may hear people um, you know, hitting their head, uh, having an accident, drowning. Uh, those are not included in these numbers here. What's included in these numbers here, um, SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, is deaths that happen in a person who has an epilepsy diagnosis, and usually they're just found alone, uh, um, deceased in bed in the morning, very tragic, as you can imagine, um, you know, or on the floor in the kitchen, uh, and nobody knows what happens, nobody was there. Um, but in some cases, they were found after... Uh, a, um, ep while they happen to be wearing an ambulatory EEG monitor, and usually these events are occurring after a grand mal seizure. Uh, and, and there's some other things we've learned about them that are, that are quite surprising. I bring this up to you because if you're like me, you'd never heard of this before, and yet it's the number two cost of years of potential life lost after stroke. Uh, and it's taking more lives every year in the U.S., uh, and probably even more beyond, than um, house fires, sudden infant death syndrome, uh, and in the UK, they said, then AIDS also. So what do they find if you happen to be wearing an EEG um, when this tragedy happens? Well, each of these is an electrode channel from uh, an EEG on your scalp, and it's sort of hyperactivated during the seizure. The seizure is kind of like a little brush fire that can spread and uh, take over the whole brain, or it can stay localized. Uh, then the brain waves we'd like to see go back to normal, but here they're all below 10 microvolts, so they're flattened. So this is called post-ictal, meaning after the seizure, generalized, because it's across all EEG channels, um, suppression, obviously, here after the seizure. That was found in all the monitored cases of SUDEP. Uh, so we don't want to see that. That's bad. It looks like your brain has shut down. Um, now, we expect if your brain has shut down, everything else is shutting down, um, but it turns out your heart's still going and um, just your breathing seems to have shut down. When we looked at those huge peaks we were getting and we said, what are these? Is the person just convulsing a lot and getting sweaty or, you know, what is this? It turned out it had nothing to do with them convulsing or how long they were convulsing, uh, but it does show high correlation with how long these brain waves are shutting down after a seizure. Now think about how weird this is, and um, by the way, this is published in neurology on top medical journals, uh, and it's been replicated now with an adult group, uh, and the graph continues up. Now, we don't, we don't know exactly why a signal on the wrist is going to get bigger uh, if your brain looks like it's shutting down. This seems a little backwards and bizarre, right, because this is triggered by stuff deep in the brain. Um, then I learned something very surprising that I didn't, didn't know. Uh, when they measure your brain waves with an EEG on the outside, they're only picking up the activity of your brain near the surface of the scalp. The emotion centers of your brain are much deeper, and in particular, some very important emotion centers that can trigger the stopping breathing and can trigger the responses that we're measuring are much deeper. So ironically, trying to read your brain waves with a brain wave reader, an EEG on your scalp, is saying nothing's going on, while this is saying there's a lot of brain activity going on. How bizarre is that? I am so glad I had tenure when I, when I first suggested we're getting you know, this correlative brain activity on the wrist that we're not getting on the head, right? Um, pretty, 
pretty freaky. Now, fortunately, others have uh, done the deep, um, no pun intended, work here of going into the brain, craniotomy, don't sign up for this unless you have to, uh, drill the holes in your skull, go in and stimulate these regions, uh, all, both read them out and activate them. And when they stimulate the right amygdala or your left amygdala, um, these are core regions involved in the threat, the anxiety, the fight or flight response, fear, uh, something we all experience a lot of at MIT. Uh, when they stimulate that right amygdala, you get a right skin conductance response, same side of the body. Uh, and when they stimulate the left, you get a left one. If that little boy had had a seizure in his right amygdala, uh, it could explain why he had a whopper of a response on one side and not the other. Um, and some other regions of the brain, it turns out, that are localized too. Moreover, it's now been shown if you go in and directly stimulate this in a repeated high frequency way, uh, it will turn off a person's breathing. In fact, it will, one of you could be sitting there reading your email, typing on the computer, um, consenting to this craniotomy. They go in and they stimulate your amygdala. You would show no signs of distress. You would stop breathing and you would not start again until they say, touched you and you went, you know, or they ask you a question and you breathe to answer it. Now, we know that seizures are like these little electrical fires. Um, they can, they're not usually deadly, fortunately, um, but they still kill more people every year in the US than house fires. And we now also know that uh, people, when they die of this, in this period of time, suit up after a seizure, um, they're usually alone. If they're attended, they're more likely to start breathing again. Somebody's there, the first thing you do, you touch the person, you say their name, they take that breath. So we realize that we need to get somebody there. Don't leave people alone if they have uh, these, if you have even one grand mal seizure a year, you're at heightened risk of suit up. So while I'm um, working at MIT on uh, affect, we decided we needed to take a, a bit of an effort to get this um, out of the lab uh, to help people who have this condition. Did a whole lot more work, uh, lots and lots, 20 different designs, versions, and thanks to the incredibly hard work of Empatica, this has now been commercialized as Embrace, and uh, it's winning design prizes and is available for under $200, which is an enormous engineering feat. Uh, it's also the case it can run, uh, it not only senses the kind of stuff we're sensing here, clinical quality data, but we are able to run onboard machine learning, very sophisticated, using ex thanks to MIT member companies, um, very sophisticated latest electronics and manufacturing processes to enable us to um, do the real-time analysis and communication so that somebody can get an alert. Uh, we also don't want it to be a stigmatizing medical device, even though we're applying for FDA. We want it to look cool. So we have, um, we're offering all kinds of cool stuff. It's, it's funny, all that consumer stuff is easy, right? We, we, do, we did sleep and steps and all that long before all those other companies did it. So we're embedding all of that in here too. Um, so it's just a really smart way to tell time and to record all of that health stuff, even if you don't have a medical condition. Um, but if you want to privately run an app that detects uh, something like what I just talked about, then you can do that. Because we're under FDA right now, I can't make medical claims about this particular device right now, but you can enroll in a clinical trial where you can use it for convulsive seizure detection right now. Uh, and meanwhile, regular people like me can buy it and wear it and get all kinds of cool other information. The other morning in my email, uh, I got this, which I've excerpted um, from one of our beta testers and family of uh, another MIT community member. Uh, we got another alert this morning, ran to her room. She was face down with a seizure, not breathing. We repositioned her and she is now pink and sleeping, uh, wearing embrace. Thank you. Um, my, my first thought was, is she, you know, after, is she okay? And the mom reassuring me she's okay, was don't trust any technology, right? We all know, like, as, while we are working to make it as accurate and, you know, everything as possible, uh, we all know that no device is perfect. Battery, the Bluetooth, 
you know, I, we could list, a, and we do, we share a long list of things that could go wrong. So um, I sort of live in worry of it not doing the right thing. Um, but we also know, she said, don't worry. We also, we know all that stuff. Um, it's still better than what we have. She, in fact, she added recently, she was mailing a doctor and telling him the story of her. The other morning, it goes off again while she's in the shower, shampooing, you know, and she, you know, usually you would wait to finish your shower to check on your child. Um, but this time she ran out and sure enough, her daughter was blue again. Um, and she got there in time and her daughter's fine. So we are, you know, we recognize now that sometimes accidental findings, uh, just when we do our homework and go through the data, are there and can make profound changes in people's lives. Now, I mentioned that I was really glad I had tenure when we started seeing something that looked correlated with deep brain activity on the wrist. <laughs> and I was like, huh? I was talking to a bunch of doctors saying, isn't this bizarre? Like, can anybody explain this? And the doctor, one doctor raises her hand and she goes, Roz, it's easy. What do you mean it's easy? It's medicine 101. Medicine 101, I took engineering. I never had medicine 101. What do you mean? And she said, when we were all in, knit together in the womb, we all had three tissue types. One of them, the ectoderm, knit together our brain, our spinal cord, our neural tissue with this largest organ on our body, the skin, from the moment we were formed. Therefore, it is no surprise that some activation in different regions of the brain can map differentially to interesting dermatones, different patterns on the skin. I wish I'd known that before. <laughs> um, but anyhow, if you're interested, I will give a URL at the end where you can get a lot more information about this. I've just published a paper going into a lot more detail on mappings that we are starting to look at between different regions of the brain, including hippocampus, very important in dementia, memory, Alzheimer's, and a whole bunch of other conditions besides epilepsy, uh, and pain studies also with the cingulate and other regions. Um, and also in uh, leading into my last topic here, uh, mood and depression. Uh, things that we uh, have been thinking about for a long time and are now really focusing on for the, for the future. Uh, I'll, I'll start the story with what one of the former directors of the Media Lab used to say to me when I was building a bunch of the wearables and affect sensing. And he would say to me, Roz, when are you going to build me the mood ring that tells me my wife's mood before I go home? <laughs> Now, we all know the mood ring was just a stupid temperature sensor. That's trivial, right? We have temperature in both of these. You know, but hey, at MIT, we don't want to do trivial stuff. We want to do hard stuff. And I wanted to, I want to do this right. Uh, and I want to do it for the right reasons, too. And so we've been looking hard at what, what do you really need? Like, you know, do you, I mean, seriously, if you, if you just know your spouse's mood, that could also raise their expectations. You know, honey, you better show up with chocolates and flowers and, you know, five days a week, and this could start to get to be a lot. But we started digging to see, like, what's the, what's the real good that we could do here? And forgive me, I'm going to show you some depressing numbers in this next slide, but I know you can handle it. Um, there's actually a very serious challenge related to mood, uh, and this is... I know we all know people, and many people in this room, I'm sure, have suffered from major depression. It is the leading cause of disability for our college students and for many other people. And in fact, and these numbers are really important because they, um, well, you'll see why, but uh, they're not a blip. They're a 15-year span that the CDC has reported on. Uh, so white men and white women um, have shown the largest increase recently in the 45 to 64 age range, 59 and 80% increase in suicides. This one, I just shake my head and, and get speechless. Uh, what a, I mean, any one suicide is a tragedy, but to think that our little girls are taking their lives. And we hear about this at top universities like MIT and Stanford and and. Harvard tends to keep theirs hush. We're working with the leading suicide expert at Harvard, and I ask them how they handle it, and they don't want to talk about it. Um, at least at MIT, we're very open, and we want to look at the data. Um, and we're trying to do a whole lot about it, too. But this is a worldwide problem. And in fact, the World Health Organization's recent huge report on this uh, says it's going to be one every 20 seconds by 2020. And here's the number I, I hope we can do something to change. 
disability and lives lost from depression, will, it will be the number one health burden. It will be greater than cancer, accidents, war, and stroke by 2030, the rate at which things are increasing worldwide. Now, I never heard people talking about this uh, before we started asking some questions here at MIT, but clearly there's a lot of big reports on it. Uh, the reason is it seems to be something we think the mental health community will do something about, doctors will do something about. And um, that's great, but I went and talked to some of the leading uh, mental health researchers who are here in Boston. They're incredibly bright and they're wonderful. And I said to one of them, you know, head of long list of things at Harvard Med School, you know, you guys, you know how to do the cognitive behavioral therapy, the brain imaging, the biochemistry, the, you know, you, you know how to like do each piece of it optimally and optimize putting it together. If we just get people to you sooner, can you help them? Can you fix this? You know, you must know how to fix this, right? And he says, we don't know how to fix it. And my heart sank. And I thought, wow, maybe this is a problem that needs engineers. <laughs> it doesn't just need medical people. It needs engineers. It really does. And I, I hope to you know, convince you it really does. And we are, my students have gotten very excited about this, and they have started, uh, you know, led a number of studies. Let me just give you a sample of the kind of things we're doing in partnership with the medical school at Harvard, okay, not trying to go it alone here. We are bringing the best of engineering, signal processing, data collection, machine learning, uh, and our ability to just put it all together mathematically uh, and measure from people sleep and wake, physical activity, light exposure, autonomic stress, texting behavior, phone call behavior, your social network dynamics, your geolocation dynamics, your patterns of movement. Uh, so far we're doing this only for college students. We'd love to uh, expand to other universities besides MIT and go beyond. The students here have been awesome about signing up and contributing data. Long term, right now, has only been 30 days a person. We really want to scale it because we need to get the seasons of change of life, not just the, the original 30-day snapshot that we did. Uh, and we would like to not only recognize the current mood uh, or emotion and whether it's a person's doing well or not, but we would like to do something that's sort of the equivalent of weather forecasting. And we would like to be able to predict it. Now, 150 years ago, people laughed at people who said they were going to forecast the weather. Ha, you know, there's no way you can predict if it's going to rain or snow this weekend. And, you know, and people were laughed at. But some crazy scientists went off and they started gathering lots of data at lots of different cities and sharing information and putting it together and building mathematical models. And lo and behold, today we all check the weather forecast. And, okay, it's not perfect, right? You know, sometimes they say eight inches of snow in Boston and my kids are mad because we get none. Uh, but we we could do much better, right? We can get people out of a city before a major hurricane hits. We can predict the big storms and we can uh, improve the outcome because we can do that. Why aren't we trying to do that with health? Why aren't we trying to do that with mental health? Now, let's take all those high dimensional complex parameters um, and roll them up into one in this vertical axis. And this is well-being. And at the top, you're doing great, and your company, you've just hired, they've just hired you, or MIT has just admitted you as a student, and your well-being is super, uh, and hopefully it's a good match, and you come in and you get even better still. Um, time is here in the horizontal axis. And as uh, time goes on and you encounter more and more major stressors, almost everybody takes a dip. But if you're resilient, hopefully you pop back up. Uh, unfortunately, not just at MIT, at most universities, and also I'm hearing at some of the very best workplaces in the world where the CEO is telling me our number one problem is depression, uh, you know, some quarter to a third and some higher rates are taking this red path. It's a very common problem. Now, you get down that path a certain distance, and um, hopefully before you get down that path, but usually you're quite a bit down that path, you get help, you get mental health help. And that's where the medical system kicks in, and they try to push you back up that, that red hill uh, to the blue line. Uh, what we would like to do, and I think it might be possible, although it is a little crazy, like weather forecasting, is could we predict back there when you look like everything's fine if you're on the red line or the blue line? Actually, let me change that since Marty was just talking about the T. Um, <laughs> if you're on the red path or the blue path. 
<laughs> OK. Uh, could we tell if you're on the red path or the blue path before you get in trouble? If we could tell which path you're on before you get in trouble, it's not only like saying there's going to be a big hurricane or a big storm, but we might be able to change the weather. Right? This isn't just the opportunity to forecast the weather. This is the opportunity to change the weather. And this isn't just the weather outside. This is the weather inside. This is what is causing that number one disease burden by the year 2030. Could we, the brains in this room, the brains of MIT alums, current MIT faculty, students, lots of departments in partnership with medical people, could we not just recognize this, but prevent this? Recognize, forecast, do the huge data analytics that allows us to identify and prevent this. Uh, is this crazy? Let me give you just one quick story, because i at the end here. Um, there was a colleague who was doing a big depression trial. 20 people who were waitlisted for the depression trial, they weren't yet getting the treatment, also happened to have bad sleep. He gave them six weeks of sleep therapy. By the end of the six weeks, 18 of those 20 no longer qualified for the depression trial. Just fixing their sleep fixed their depression. We see at MIT, um, the good sleepers and the bad sleepers were good as highly regular sleep, and bad as really irregular sleep. When we control for the total duration of sleep on average, um, the highly irregular sleepers have significantly lower mental health, significantly more sadness, less alertness, and much higher stress. Now, which way does causality go here? We still have a lot of work to do to show that. Other studies digging into that are suggesting the sleep influence on mood is greater than the mood influence on sleep, although we do know there's a little bit of both. I'm going to wrap up here uh, so we have a few more minutes for questions. I've taken you on a journey here of some of our surprises, trying to build technology that helps people communicate emotion. It started, uh, this, this particular journey I told you about started with people on the autism spectrum telling me they weren't being understood properly. Uh, we started to take technology that used to require being wired and in the lab, built it in ways where we could go out and get data outside the lab and start to just learn from what was going on outside the lab, but inside of people. Uh, from there, we ran into surprising findings, things not happening. It wasn't just general arousal and sweat. It turns out that you can get a skin conductance response without any sweat. Turns out it can be different in different places. Turns out that uh, if you go in and map it to different regions of the brain, you can find uh, patterns there that are much more specific. When we built a sensor into this Domo sweatband that could measure uh, skin conductance around the clock, we found asymmetric activation that signaled uh, a seizure. Uh, with the help of Empatica, we've turned that into a device that can very sophisticated run machine learning issue alerts uh, while also collecting all kinds of other fun health activity, sleep data for all of the rest of us uh, so we can use the most sophisticated electronics to learn about our health or to issue private alerts if we need. We're now continuing to work with brain scientists to uh, learn more about these mappings, in particular the ones that relate to mood and depression. These are core regions of the brain involved in some of the hardest to treat kinds of depression. And we're asking now, can we move beyond the detection to the forecasting? And not just forecasting, but there's some really cool machine learning we can do that doesn't just predict, but that also helps us identify which variables need to change. So that it's not just about you reading in the newspaper, gee, I should be getting seven hours of sleep, uh, or I should be getting more regular sleep, but you could figure out like what applies to you. We find some people have uh, something that works for them that's different than what works for somebody else. So why should it be a one-size-fits-all recommendation? Why can't each of us, if we're willing to share some of our data uh, in a hopefully very respected way um, from our wearables and our smartphones, why can't we learn what's optimal for us? I think we can. So I will be happy to take questions now. I'm going to leave you with the URL where you can get more publications. Oh, and also, um, Empatico was just nominated for the Serendipity Award, Alexander Fleming, for this finding. So I wanted to sort of shamelessly ask you if you would be willing to click twice <laughs> um, to vote on that if you want while, we're, while I'm taking questions. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm a, a Media Lab alum. Um, 
We have epilepsy in my family. It runs in my brother and myself. Oh, well, I have a different kind of seizure and another cousin. But uh, you were saying that um, now you can detect it when, when the child is going to have a seizure. And you said that if someone has been touched or talked, uh, he may, she may react, right? What if the device does the sound, like if the mom doesn't come out of the shower or if the... Yeah, so right now, if there's nobody there, um, so first what the device does when it detects uh, an event that is programmed to detect is it vibrates. Um, that alone may stimulate some people. It goes to the person's phone, which hopefully is within Bluetooth range and powered on and on the network, uh, Wi-Fi or other, and it um, activates this alert which calls people you've designated to call. And they get calls, they get texts. So as you can imagine, there are several places in that process where the signal might not get through. Um, if nobody comes, the outcome is the same as it usually is, where the person is unattended. In most cases, they're still okay. Uh, you know, this is still a low risk of, of death, um, but unfortunately it does, it's still taking more lives every year than house fires, and you don't build a house without a smoke detector, right? Um, so this is sort of trying to add in the smoke detector. It's not perfect, but Because we kind helps. of feel when it's gonna happen, and sometimes we can stop it, no? Like you go to sleep right away, but sometimes cannot. Yeah, right? we're not <laughs> claiming to do anything invasive to stop it right now. There are uh, companies like Neuropace that make implanted um, brain stimulators that might, in some cases, with very localized seizures, I think they're getting like about 25-30% effectiveness in some folks there with that. But can um, we record is, like a voice like saying your name, like wake up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, um, this is coming out with an API soon. We're, we're going to be able to customize a lot more stuff. Right now we've just been um, you know, nose down to get out the, uh, especially devices for Indiegogo supporters who bought it um, some more than two years ago. So we're kind of slow getting it out. It turned out to be a lot more work than we expected. Yes, on the, this side. I'm a physician and I've spent a lot of years in the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. And over time, we have decreased as an industry our investment in mental health, in part because of the difficulty of measuring the impact of therapeutic interventions and mm -hmm. placebo effect. So in addition to the prevention and the sleep interventions, are you working with companies or entities on using this to kind of improve our ability to measure the effect of other kinds of interventions? Yes, yes. We are involved with a lot of companies uh, on the measurement, and they all have sort of different goals. We're part of kind of four clinical trials right now in the depression area, as well as this more uh, of my red-blue path diagram. Uh, most of the work companies want to fund is on the right side of that, where there's a clear diagnosis and sort of clear outcomes. We're a bit renegade here at MIT because we want to work on the left side of that graph. We want to work where there's no diagnosis yet, where the person looks fine, and, and they say they're fine. We're even noticing some people reporting that they're perfectly happy for three days in a row before their roommate drags them off to MIT Medical and they wind up in McLean Hospital and really in bad shape. So we're recognizing that a lot of these current you know, measures are just not you know, they're, they're not right, but we are having trouble getting companies to fund the left side. We have a couple who are doing it, who are recognizing, hey, this is, our, this is most of our workforce, right, who's on that left side. Um, and we, the well-being measures, I, I skipped over that vertical axis, it's very complex. There's lots of candidate ways to do it. Our approach tends to be not to just rely on one way, but to measure a lot of ways and handle the complexity. We can handle multidimensional measures. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, I was told I should shift from the left to the right. Uh, I think we can handle that. So over here next, and then we'll come back to the left. Yes. So I have a really quick question. On the red and blue path, uh, you mentioned the you know, happier people had regular sleep and the less happy people had irregular sleep. Does the quantity of sleep impact that at all, or is it just regularity? Like if you get two hours regularly, are you happy, or do you need seven hours regularly? <laughs> I, I think we, we ought to be able to answer that in an individualized way in the future. Let me say for the group data that we have right now, um, most MIT students were getting sort of six and a half to eight hours of sleep. So we don't have real extremes on a regular basis. So those are kind of outliers, so I, I, can't, um, I can't really say there. But when we sorted it based on like if they were kind of averaging less than six and a half versus averaging more than seven and a half, that wasn't the biggest factor. The biggest factor was the regularity of their sleep, not the duration. Yes, over here now, sorry, maybe. Uh -huh. 
Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm very excited and it reminds me what Stephen Hawking said was one of the highest threats on humankind, which is human aggression. And I think that, you know, I think we are closer to an evidence-based uh, uh, path, hopefully, with what you just said. I just wanted to comment two things. The first one is, in the mental health industry, everything is evidence-based practice. There, for example, is something called multisystemic therapy, which yes. shows there are some uh, economic models that for every dollar invested there, you get four dollars of savings. And I can see the, the value of this on, on, on mental mm -hmm. health. However, my question is, there are 42 million Americans with sleep amnia that gives you an 82, 84 million dollars potential revenue, by the way. My question is, have you analyzed how can you pair your technology for something so simple and common like sleep amnia, for example? Mm. Um, yeah, people are often asking us about the really well-known things like sleep apnea, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, we have, uh, because we built a researcher device, we have a lot of researchers in those areas who are now using this device to collect that data um, for studies there. Right now, I don't have um, results on apnea. We were not seeing the big sympathetic surges with it that we would expect to see. However, there's some heart rate variability related stuff that looks interesting there. Um, there are some very interesting findings coming out related to the diabetes and the heart disease um, and also related to the other one I'm often asked about it when somebody appears to be brain dead and they um, you know can we help with that and there was just a paper published out of Brigham Women's Hospital in the um, neurology ICU there um, showing uh, that this data actually was significantly predictive of whether people were going to survive or not. So that was extremely interesting too. Um, the, none of these things are like a silver bullet for everything, right? This is a piece of a complex system, and it's a piece that has been missing, that we haven't been able to get that objective evidence for in the past, and now we can. So we are helping provide more of that very important evidence-based measurement, which will show us it's useful in some places and not in others. Yeah, I was told I could take one more question, so I think this microphone gets to pick. Yes, thanks. Hi. Uh, before I ask my question, because it's going to sound a little negative, I don't mean to be negative. Um, you asked the question, why aren't we doing more forecasting with health? And the, I'm interested in your thoughts about the potential for abuse of this information. For example, predicting facial expressions to sell us more things. I'm already pretty creeped out by Google following everything yeah. I've ever clicked. <laughs> And this, or this, a second perhaps yes. misuse of this would be the TSA seeing some kind of facial expression that's perhaps due to a disability mm -hmm. and then pulling people out. So there's this whole other yes. side for it. And what are your thoughts yeah. about how to deal with that? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, when I first wrote my book, Affective Computing, I, you know, usually when you write a book starting a new area, you talk only about the positives. I included a chapter addressing exactly these things from the beginning. Uh, I um, was excited when we, we started Affectiva that you know, even when you're a struggling startup and people you know, want to give you money, you, know, you sort of are told you have to take whatever you can get. But we turned away some of these kinds of things where people wanted to sense your emotion without your consent. And to this day, they still are staunchly opt-in, clarify you know, what's happening, what's going on with your data. Um, you know, and that continues to be our ethic. Also with the wearables, we make it easy to take it off, control your you know, We're trying to do all we can. Now, that doesn't prevent other people from abusing it. Um, there's still, I still have some real worries there. You know, I, will, I saw lots of hands go up. I will hang out during, I think there's a 30-minute break after this. Um, I will hang out and join you guys and feel free to come up to me. We can talk more about this. I also have a whole bunch of papers online, that URL, that address some of the ethics, the concerns. It's complicated, right? It's not as simple as we just do the right thing. We got to try to get other people to do the right thing, um, which brings me to the next thing, which is we are all the public now, right, as well as MIT. And so the more that we leave here and talk to people about this and talk about like good values versus not, I think that shapes what people do much more than rules and regulations. Rules and regulations are important. I do think we need them. Um, but ultimately, people disobey rules and regulations, right? You know, we need to just promote a culture that shows respect for human feelings. So if you take away anything today about affective computing, it's that when we started it, it was to show respect for human feelings. And let's do all we can to make sure that technology continues to honor 
uh, human beings and show respect for human feelings. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.